Uh, so I had the pleasure of actually seeing the, uh, the beta of this talk in uh, Maryland at uh, Unallocated Space, and I was very impressed with it, and I don't do crypto, and I felt like I was able to follow along most of it. It was very interesting from a historical standpoint as well as the math involved and how these guys uh, took a new approach to doing what they do. So um, actually, when it was over, I asked them <laughs> specifically. I'm like, hey, you guys maybe want to submit this to Sky.com. So I was very glad that they did, and I'm very glad that they're here. So um, I know you'll enjoy it. All right, thank you, guys. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to talk today a little bit about the cryptanalysis of the enigma, or how I met your mother. <laughs> when we hit this, there we go. Uh, so uh, I'm Bob Weiss, uh, PW Crack, I'm president and founder of Password Crackers, and I'm a DEF CON goon. Benjamin Gaddy, I have done work recently on the Android, uh, porting OpenVPN products to the Android. Don't tell anybody because I think we're a little bit premature in that announcement, but uh, that's fun. And we met at Hackerspace in Charlotte, kicked it off, and he's talking about cracking the Enigma machine, and I'm like, what the fuck? I mean, you know, wasn't that like really old? So, uh, he's going to tell you why it's cool, but if Alan Turing were alive today, right, I mean, he'd be right here with us. He would be, like, fucking around with computers and fucking around with cryptanalysis and fucking around with the badge and fucking around with... <laughs> All right. So, uh, demo time. Fuck it, we're going to do it live. Uh, we are going to do this live. We're going to break some uh, an Enigma message. Uh, we did this, uh, this unique message for SkydogCon. Um, I gave Ben the crypt text just now, and he's going to kick this thing off. Uh, it does take typically 20 to 45 minutes. So uh, we're going to start it now, and you know, we'll see what happens. Demo fail could possibly happen. You never know. Always an option. Right. It, it, failure is always an option. All right, so... So while that's running, and again, did you, did you pop up at least a little bit? You sh we should go back to that and show a little bit about the, just what the ciphertext looks like. OK. <laughs> I want you to see sort of how mangled it is. But, uh, but while we're doing that, so where's the ciphertext up there? Is that the, that's where we're starting off? And that's going to change as, as it, it, basically the software that we have running is basically going to keep improving on its best guess of what the decryption is. So. Right. So that's going to start, yeah, which one is going to change? No, this is, this is cool. This is actually, um, this is totally accidental, right? This is actually not the broken text. It just right, it just ended up happen. as Japan. You see patterns and everything. Right, but, the, um, uh, but it's, gonna, it's basically it's going to try a decryption, and then it's going to try a second one. It's going to compare the first one to the second one, see which one's better. And it's always going to put its current best guess up on the top. So we, you see it up on the top, current best guess. Not, oh, we don't, we don't even we don't have, have We don't have Yeah, it we don't even have a current best guess yet. But it's going to start to put that up. And the first you know, time it gets there is going to be crap, and it's, not, it's completely gibberish. Um, and then it will start, you'll start to see some of it pop up. But anyway, so why do we care about the Enigma? Uh, the Enigma machine occurs at a very interesting inflection point in the history of cryptography. So prior to the Enigma machine, you've got um, Caesar cipher, then monoalphabetic ciphers, polyalphabetic ciphers, visionaire ciphers. And you can look at sort of it, well, they're getting more complex, more complex, more complex. And each time we do a cryptanalysis of these things, we're able to break it. Cryptanalysis typically wins, right? So as the guys breaking the codes are typically doing better than the guys creating the codes in the period prior to the Enigma. And as the Enigma machine comes on board, all of a sudden you see this massive spike of complexity. Entropy really kicks off, and it's the first time we really start to see something that could be very hard to break. Um, now, obviously, Turing breaks it, and we're going to break it, so we haven't quite gotten there. But it is right at that point where you know, it's like, well, after this, uh, cryptanalysis is not typically going to win. Uh, and the other, the other thing, we, reason we care about the Enigma machine is there is this fascinating World War II narrative about you know, how we break it, we're able to keep the secret of the fact that we broke it, um, secret from the Germans, and so it really does win the war. And there's all these stories of you know, the, the guys getting into the submarines, stealing the machines, uh, the poles, and that type of thing. So there's all these very interesting stories around the Enigma and around the World, uh, World War II effort um, so, it's, again, it's, uh, there's, there's both of those things going on, and uh, that's why it's sort of interesting to study. 
So the first point I want to make about the Enigma is there is no the Enigma machine, right? Um, there are multiple versions of the Enigma machine. There's Army and Navy versions. There's three and four wheel versions. There's multiple reflectors. There's variable reflectors, et cetera. There are actually guys who collect these machines. They're, they're very interested in sort of the physical box and you know, how, how good the condition of the machine is and, uh, and the, the patina of the thing. And so the, these differences may appear to be uh, unimportant, but they're critical because if the Germans had introduced a new machine every two or three years in the same way that they upgraded their existing machine, it would have really created a problem. But what happened is they started with a fairly stock machine. The Enigma was sold commercially to banks for your transactions. It wasn't very complicated, it didn't have a patch bag, and as a consequence, it was easy to uncover and the Poles did so. Then they upgraded it a little, and then they upgraded and they changed it a little, and then they made another wheel. But in each case, the marginal improvement was not so great that Alan Turing and his crew at Bletchley Park were unable to just add a little complexity to what they had already done, and they were able to build on, a, on what they had already done. And, and it was because they had approached this in an incremental way that did two things. It created the constant opportunity to break it, and also the constant opportunity to develop new technologies. And that's, I think, really the important takeaway from the Enigma process, is that in Bletchley Park, they invented the computer. And they did so because they were chasing the Germans' development of the Enigma machine, and later we'll see other machines. All right, so there, again, no, no single Enigma machine, lots of different versions. But I want to kind of run you through sort of how the Enigma works so you understand what we're doing and, uh, and what the software does and that type of thing. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to grossly oversimplify, right? So this is not going to enable you to build one, um, but we're just trying to get you, get you the idea. But we know a guy who can. Right, but we know a guy who can. Uh, so as you can see, there's three wheels in the three-wheel Enigma version. Um, there, it is supplied with five wheels. Uh, so you have to get one of five wheels into each of three different slots. And obviously, you can't reuse a wheel, because once you put wheel number one in, you don't have wheel number one available to you. Um, so that gives you 60 options. Uh, the possible permutations of putting three, three unique wheels. Do you think wheels. that's the wheel marker? Is that wheel four, that's wheel one, and that's wheel three? That's uh, certainly possible. Uh, each of the wheels has a ring setting on it. Uh, basically, you can twist the, the thing outside, around it. There's a little notch on the edge there. You're moving the position of the notch um, to any one of 26 different positions. Uh, so if there are three wheels, I'm sorry, there's, there's three wheels, but the notch, basically, it, it works like the, it's the odometer piece of the Enigma. So each, uh, the left wheel is going to push the one to the next to the left, and that's going to push the other one like an odometer, but obviously the one on the far left can't push anything. So this is called the fast wheel, and this is the slow wheel, and this is the middle wheel. Right. So, so there's, uh, there are... 26 possible ring settings, or 26 to the third possible ring settings, but the last ring setting doesn't make any difference, right? It doesn't push anything, so we don't really care about it. So there's only really, that should have been 26 to the two, not 262 options, 26 to the two options. Message settings, once I've got the thing in the machine, I can rotate each of the wheels to a starting position. The letters uh, show, through the, uh, show through the display. That is 26 to the three different message settings or 17,000 different message settings. And, uh, and then the plug board is there's a lot of entropy in the plug board. Uh, we're going to connect with these wires down at the bottom. Um, any letter to any other letter, um, that's going to affect how, how each letter, when you press down on the machine and, and hit the encode, is connected to any other one. It's uh, 150 trillion, and the calculation is, what is it, 26 factorial, factorial? So this is a double factorial complicate. Uh, problem because each time that you populate a plug board, you're, you're filling two holes, so you have two less in your options menu, and uh, the mathematical term for that is, is the double factorial represented by the bang bang. So, uh, so what you look at, when you, when you multiply the, uh, the wheels times the ring settings times the message settings times the plug board, uh, I think I got all that right. You're looking at an, a complexity in terms of the setup of the machine of 2 to the 77th. And 2 to the 77th is, that's strong crypto today, right? So DES at 2 to the 56, that's breakable. You get a bunch of GPUs or FPGAs, um, you can do that. 
you get a, uh, a special purpose computer. It's been done multiple times. We can, we can break two to the 56, right? Um, AES, two to the 128, we're not gonna get there right now, right? That's more than, two to the 128 is more than the number of atoms in the universe. Uh, two to the 77, that's good strong crypto. If you, got, if you got that expected complexity, if the machine was able to maintain that, um, you would not be breaking these messages. Uh, and uh, lastly, let me go over uh, just sort of a very brief sort of history of what's happening here. In 1932, Marian Rajewski and the Polish Cipher Bureau um, are able to uh, understand the, the mathematical characteristics of the Enigma machine. Uh, they uh, are correct in their guess that their uh, neighbor, Germany, is looking hostile. Poland may be under attack at any moment. We better start understanding what these guys are doing. And, uh, and they're able to, using math, basically uh, understand the wheel orders and that type of thing. Now, they're working with the three-wheel Enigma, so there's only three wheels, um, but they are able to deduce the, uh, the settings of each of those wheels. Uh, and they're able, by 1938, to build a machine uh, which is able to uh, decrypt those settings. Um, unfortunately, in 1938, the Germans add two more wheels to bring it up to five. The, uh, the poles uh, go dark. They can no longer read the messages. And um, uh, so that's a little bit of a setback for them. Uh, in 1939, the poles, and they're reading the German messages, right? It's not that big of a deal, but it's like, hey, we're going to get invaded. <laughs> Time to get the heck out of here. Uh, so uh, the, the Polish Cipher Bureau and the, the top cryptanalysts crypt of their day uh, leave Aunt Poland and tell the French, uh, oh, by the way, we know how to read all the German messages. So the critical inflection point <laughs> on this page is that the Poles built a damn machine. The Germans did not build machines. They had a very uh, comprehensive cryptanalysis uh, program. It wasn't centralized. They did not build machines. They used a lot of pencils and a lot of paper. They continued to use the pencils and the paper. They maybe got better at using the pencils and paper, but they never took the step to put it into, into a mechanical device. The poles did. It was a small device, probably would fit in that box. It had a couple motor, it had one motor basically, and it spun like a clock. It had a, a slow wheel, a faster wheel, and a yet faster wheel. Uh, and, it, and it did this analysis, and maybe some uh, relay circuit there to trigger uh, a particular logical event that occurred, right? But they committed it to a computing device, and that's critical. Because as we said earlier, the, the history of the Enigma is essentially building step by step, right? As the thing got more complicated from a small machine. And at the end of the war, we, we have a very different world. So, anyway, so uh, the Poles tell the French, and the French are uh, all those, sacre bleu, I don't know what to do with this. Uh, no idea. Uh, so they tell the British. Uh, Hey, guys, you've, these guys are reading these things. Do uh, you have any idea what to do? The British uh, stand up a team uh, at Bletchley Park with Alan Turing and uh, build out a bomb, a machine, 1930, um, to do this. I'm sorry, that's, we, that's 1940, right? Typo. Uh, and, um, uh, but basically what they're doing is uh, crib-based decryption, which is what we would call known plain text attack. They need 12 characters in a row of known plain text to run that bomb. And, uh, and then eventually, at the very end of that, um, 1941, they're decrypting such a volume of messages and so many of these things that, uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, they bring the Americans in to manufacture additional bombs. And th that's sort of where the Americans start to learn the secret and what's going on. Uh, so we, they're part of the intelligence earlier on. Um, so Churchill is sharing intelligence with Roosevelt. But, uh, but in 1941, we're sort of brought into the mechanics of how the decryption is working and the, uh, the rest of it. Um, before we go on, do you want to go see, check the demo? OK. So this is our first, uh, this is where we are right now. We're getting some results back. Um, it looks fairly garbled still. Yeah, that's not readable. Right. Nothing happening. Um, but what we're looking for is, is chai, is a conformance of the frequency analysis of the letters to the expected language, which in this case is English. 
Uh, in their case, uh, of course, it would have been German, but they didn't use Chai in the war. Um, they used they, they used different forms of Italian. Right. We're not doing any kind of known plain text. So if you go on, I think, uh, yeah, this is uh, this is you now. All right. So this is a considerable challenge. It's 77 bits uh, deep crack, which was Des and a couple others later, right? Cracked 56 bits, but there's a lot of multiplicity between 56 and 77. Somebody maybe knows, but it's, I don't know, a million? No, much much larger than that, <laughs> right. 11? We, we two, to 11. The, two to, two to the 22nd power. Right. Two to the 22nd power, what is that? Four million. Four million, I was close. <laughs> hey, order of magnitude, man, give it to me. <laughs> All right, so four million, you need four million Des crack computers to brute force the Enigma uh, parameter set. So it's, it's, it's a lot of computational um, potential. Uh, we, we're not doing a brute force, right? Um, so what we're doing is we're looking for weaknesses in the cryptographic machine. And the Enigma machine was meant to be portable as an alternative to its strategic communication network where they used the Lorentz cycle, cipher in the operational network. Uh, the command on the ground, the, the, the roaming units, they needed something that was more portable. They could put it in a backpack and maybe carry it. It's still a really heavy device, uh, but it is a battery-operated machine. And in order to make it smaller and less complicated, they took a little tiny shortcut. And cryptanalysis, as Bob reminded me, is the business of taking little mistakes by that guy and blowing them into big fucking deals, right? <laughs> so they folded the electronics, so they went in the one wheel and then back out with the reflector, if, if we would show you um, that um, picture of the wheels again, it starts from the right, it goes to the left, it bounces off the reflector, and then comes back. And as a consequence of reflecting, they had to create a situation in which A could be mapped to any character in the alphabet, with the one exception of the letter A, right? So there's a story, a great story, in which uh, they come to Alan Turing and they're showing him some text. And he's looking at this text. It, it looks like the gibberish we showed you at the beginning. And it's you know, a bunch of conversations. And Alan Turing is looking at this data. And he realizes, after looking at it for a few minutes, he says, there are no Ds anywhere. The only way you can get text that essentially has no Ds is if you're so fucking lazy, right? You're sitting there, you're smoking. And you have to do a test transmittal every four hours for a variety of reasons. Maybe one is to pollute the traffic analysis. Maybe one is to make sure that the system is up, maybe whatever. But your crypto unit has to send a transmittal every four hours just to, to keep on the time scale. You're so bored, your fingers are occupied, you mash down on the D key repetitively, just D, 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 D. And this essentially becomes known plain text. Because what is the text? It is a string of Ds. And they were able to use this operational mistake to uh, extract out the wiring sequence of a newly released uh, wheel. Every time they added a wheel, of course, they didn't have the mapping for that wheel. It was difficult to, to go to the bomb machine, which they used for that, and to then uh, you know, plug that wheel into the machine and run the test. So they needed the wiring of the machine to do what they were doing. And in one case, that is how they got it. So they did not ana analyze Chai. They did a logical test based on this exclusion of the, of the same letter, which is a side channel attack based on known crypt text. If you know that the word weather station or weather report is in the message that arrives every morning at 6 a.m., then you can just slide along until you find where weather report can possibly fit because you know where it can't fit is where there's a W where, and, and the W in weather report, right? It can't fit there, so you slide it along. You find the place where it might fit and then you kind of process out maybe that's what it was. So it was a known plain text attack. This is not, this is more <laughs> classical frequency analysis. Um, you, should, you should explain what chai is. Right, I should explain what chai is. So starting with E, uh, that is the most frequent letter in the English alphabet. T is the second, and it diminishes like this, right? So if we take all of the letters and add them up, we should get a distribution that looks something like this, an outlier, you know, some high frequencies and some, low, and some tail. 
noise obviously would be a straight line across. And then my code actually produces an inverse. Why? Because the least common letter is the letter E. But uh, mostly we just care about this distribution. We use this in two ways. One is sorted like this, where E is the first. But the other is that we just sort them by the largest first because we really don't know what character is mapped to what other character. But if the characters such as they are fall into a line like this, this is probably a language. And if they're noisy, that's probably just noise. So, let me interrupt. So, uh, so we're going to talk to you about two innovations that we've brought to the Enigma machine um, in this presentation. Um, and this is the real, uh, the real science of what we've done. Um, the rest of it was just sort of setting the stage. Um, so there are two innovations. The first is Stecker isolation. So you recall that the plug board is where the real complexity and the Enigma machine lives, right? It's trillions of options. Spinning the wheels is actually trivial relative to the complexity that's represented in the plug board. So how do you break a plug board? It's a cesarean cipher, right? Everything is mapped to something else. In this case, E is mapped. Now, it's a McNair, right? So E is mapped here to T. E is mapped here to O. E is mapped here to U. E is mapped here to, to O. E is mapped here to R, and so forth. But we collect all of, all of the E's, and we analyze what we're getting for them, and we should expect to see chai. Um, this is really important. In other words, you can take a series of crypt text and break it down by its character. So you can just start with the E's, ignore everything other than the E's, and you should still see that the E's, when they're decrypted, should fall out in this pattern. Because the E's, now the same is true with the D. If you were to take the D, they should also fall out in that pattern. In other words, the characters in your crypt text are separable in this model, where there is a, uh, where there is a, a cesarean cipher, which is essentially what that is, right? It's a remap. If there's a cesarean cipher component to your data, then the crypt text should be break, should be ice, uh, can be isolated by the individual characters and analyzed uh, by itself. That's important because if this is mapped properly, but this is mapped, but the Y is mapped improperly, one of these characters will produce chai and the others will not produce chai. So, so one thing that this allows, <coughs> this significantly reduces the complexity of the plug board <coughs> is the, uh, the short answer from 150 trillion possibilities to 26 to the third or 17,656 possibilities. That's the double end factorial. <clears throat> and that, that right there equals pwned, right? That's, uh, that takes the complexity from something that was unmanageable and unbreakable and two to the 77th down into, oh yeah, we can do this on a GPU, on a laptop, in under 45 minutes, at a demo, at a conference, right? So. So that, that, was, that was the key piece right there. Um, but there's one other point I want to make about the, um, that uh, Stecker isolation uh, innovation. Uh, what we did in software is we modeled, um, we modeled something that can't exist in the real world. Uh, in the real world, for the Enigma to work, you need to complete a circuit. A plug board needs to be connected to two letters. Um, it obviously, it cannot be connected to itself, and you can't plug A into nothing, right? It has to be connected to something else. So if you were sitting around trying to emulate a, an Enigma machine and then run all of the possibilities <clears throat> through your, uh, your brute force attack, uh, you would emulate a plug board that has two ends on it. Uh, effectively, what we've done is created something in software which is impossible in the real world. Uh, and that that piece was the key to being able to break it. Emulating something that is impossible is the key to breaking it. And uh, need to think about that model and think about the implications of that when you're doing other types of emulations in software and other types of modeling in software. 
Um, so I, I don't have another good example of being able to, of where that could be used. Um, but we know that, look, pretty much all of software is some sort of an emulation or a model, right? I mean, that's what we're doing. That's what all of commerce is about, right? Is emulating buyers and sellers and, you know, routes and schedules and everything else. Think about an airline, right? They emulate an airline system and everything that they're doing is, is trying to figure out, well, what happens in the real world and how can I model that in software? And, uh, and what we did is modeled something that can't exist. So you have to think about sort of whether or not that would be significant in your system. Anyway. To explain and adjust his point slightly, what we were doing is taking the machine apart, essentially catching data midstream and, and bucketing it there. By bucketing, I mean putting all the E's in one place and putting all the B's in one place and then counting the results uh, in the middle of the, in the machine rather than waiting for all of the complexity to play out because we can actually separate the machine into two parts and, and analyze the first part of the machine separate from the last part of the machine. So the point is that the conceptual machine has more strength in its totality, but in its internals, it actually has this weakness. Um, the, the next observation, this is fairly particular to the Enigma machine, is that there wasn't a lot of complexity actually in the wheels to lung. The wheels to lung is the wheel settings. The point at which the notch is placed doesn't matter very much because when you move the notch up exactly one tick, it means that every time you go around the wheel, you're going to be right 25 ticks, and then you're going to be wrong for one tick, and then you're going to be right 25 times, right? If you're right 25 times out of 26, that's right enough. When you're just counting frequencies, that's, that's a lot of information bleeding through. If you're right 23 times out of 26, that's still a lot, right? So you can be off on this notch by at least two or three sets without being significantly wrong. Um, and that means that the, the, the wheel stalong is really not a lot of complexity. So, so wash that off the complexity board as well. Um, specifically, these settings, right, AAA, AAA, it, it results in small errors. This is a sample sentence showing diagonal conflation. This is properly spelled, right? But if you had this wrong, you, what you'd see is that this is a sample sentence, and you get a couple of errors at, at points 25, 26, and, and, and 1. And then you'd have more just this long string of perfect data, and then you get a couple more errors over here. So but that, wheel... that wrong sentence, right, has chai. That has letter frequency. It's not quite as close to the real letter frequency as we would typically expect, but it is clearly not noise, right? right. And it's clearly not noise, not only to you looking at it, you can clearly look at it and see words there, but it is also clearly not noise when we do a mathematical analysis of the chai of that wrong statement. So that was also important. So let me, let's go back to the demo one sec, see if we're Absolutely. anywhere. So we are presumably still cranking along. I don't see legibility. You do see a word? Where, where would you mark? From line nine to 8, 60% over. Down a little bit, right to the top, down. There you go, F-R-O-M. Um, From right there. Yeah. Could be. Could be coincidence. What, it could be coincidence, but once you start to see words, you will see them, and, they'll, and they will start to show up, especially small words like that. Uh, little parts of words will start to, uh, to push see, through. Uh, let me give me a pointer a second. So this is also interesting. You get some E's up here, and then right below, we got some other double E's there. And there's some more over there. Some more, yeah. This, some, some unusual things happening in our crypt text. So you want to talk about a really interesting machine. This is the Lawrence machine. I am so excited about this machine because the Enigma machine is all gears and levers, and it looks like this, right? But this is not letters and numbers. If you look really closely, there are little tiny teeth on here, and each one represents a bit. That's right. This is not alphanumerics. This is binary. This is a digital encryption system. This was used at the same time as the Enigma machine, but it was used by the German high command for, for strategic communications. They were longer. They were to more fixed locations. More often, they were running over wires instead of, of aerials. And uh, this machine is super heavy. You do not want to be carrying one of these around on your backpack. Um, but this machine has a series of, of, of uh, wheels here, very similar to the others. 
Uh, it actually has two sets of wheels. The, the second one is presumably in the back. Um, but this machine is what the Germans were using while Bletchley Park was using the Colossus machine to decrypt them. So they didn't start with the Colossus machine. They analyzed the, the paper. And by paper, this can be pretty hard to see, but there is a wheel there. And in the background, there is a machine there that's running paper around in a big loop. And they were producing these ticker tapes from the transmittals. They were about five bits across. And each bit represented a character. But the encryption at that point was binary. They were not mapping an A to a Z. They were toggling a bit using an X or algorithm. So hello, XOR, all modern cryptography, right? Begins on, uh, not, not exactly on this machine. It, it had an inventor, but this is a huge implementation of XOR as a, a cryptography technique in World War II. And this is the result. And this is really remarkable, because remember that the Poles created a machine to do the analysis. Germans did not create a machine to do the analysis. In England, they created the Bletchley Park, which all the cryptanalysis that was going on, there was no secondary crypt, uh, Bletchley Park. Had the Germans bombed Bletchley Park, cryptography in England would have ended. The Germans, on the other hand, were running paper pushers around in all of their units. I mean, they had cryptography everywhere, and they had lots of cryptanalysis, but it wasn't centralized, and it wasn't mechanized. It did not participate. Meanwhile, what's the guy's name in Germany that uh, invents the first computer? Heath something. No, 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 not Keith. Uh, Robinson. Yeah, Heath. Precursor to that. No, the, the, the Heath. Conrad. Okay. Conrad Zeus. Right. right? Okay, Conrad right. Zeus is sitting in the unemployment mm -hmm. line in Germany. He builds the first computer in his mom's basement, literally, out of relays. And a practice we still, you know, use we, we, today. We, absolutely. <laughs> Who hasn't built their first computer in their mom's basement? Raise their hand. <laughs> right. Close enough. Close enough. That counts. So, so he's sitting in the unemployment lines, right? The bread lines in Germany, fictitiously, uh, doing nothing with his computer, whilst Bletchley Park is kicking some serious butt in the war. And this is because the Germans just did not make the gray. They just not did not make the corner from paper and pencils to machines. And as a consequence, uh, you know, the, the Colossus was not the first idea out of the bag, right? I mean, first it was the bomb, which we've offered you zero pictures of, I think, so far. Right. Right, that's important. Um, uh, it, it wasn't the bomb, which is a completely mechanical slash relay-driven device until it's upgraded at the end to be faster with tubes. And then finally, this device, Ends up, these are all tubes, right? This, is, this machine is largely tubes. There are some slow counters in here that are relays, but the, the fast action here is all um, these series of tubes. Mind that those are all tubes. That may be a relay. Uh, this guy's actually uh, still working on it, right? They rebuilt the machine. They brought it back to life, literally out of the, uh, out of the blueprints that had, had failed to make it into the, into the fire. Uh, Winston Churchill ordered that this device be uh, destroyed into sizes no larger than a man's fist after the war. This is computer history. And Winston Churchill orders it destroyed in obscurity until 1977, right? So we, we, we wake up in 1977, Steve Jobs is making a computer and doesn't know the history of the computer. Anyway, so I want to go back, go back to that one there a second. So the, I think the key piece that you need to take away is um, the Lorenz is, is your first digital uh, encryption. Uh, it's, it's, again, encrypting bits using XOR. Uh, well, if you're not using letters anymore, you're not doing the Enigma thing, uh, you're doing digital, then you're clearly going to need a computer to, to uh, decrypt that. So that's where this comes from, right? The Colossus is built to do that piece of work. And it's, it, is a, um, it is an incremental step from the Enigma and from the other work that's happening. I want to talk about this quote is uh, like twice in England, someone said to me, yeah, it's a nice bit of kit. Uh, so to them, a nice bit of kit is any huge mechanical or uh, electronic thing with lots of parts and is very complex and has blinky lights. 
So uh, yeah, they like it. It's uh, to them, they call it a nice bit of kit. So real click on the operation of the Colossus. This is the first computer, right? So what is it composed of? First of all, they found about 4,000 characters of key space because they got a double transmitted message called the depth. Uh, there was a mistake made in a transmittal, and the guy said, okay, just no problem, I will send it again. And he says, I'm sending it again with the same code, right? Don't, don't be doing that. That's, that's candy for cryptanalysis. Right. <laughs> same message, same code is redundant. You'd have to send the same message with a slightly different one. Right, he, so it's, he made some typos. It's always <laughs> slightly different, right? You, miss, you, you abbreviate something in the, in the second message that you typed out fully, and from there on out, you know, everything is uh, off, by, off by four. It doesn't matter how much it's off by, really. Um, but yeah, you try that trick and cryptanalysis will pwn you. I don't know if it's still viable today, but it is an XOR technology and I suspect it's very dangerous. Yeah, let's, uh, you wanna go back to the demo again, see if we're getting any closer? Okay. I'm uh, yeah, curious. Yeah, because it's probably gonna break quickly when it does. Anybody see anything nice? Any eye candy? No. We still have from. Is it still running? here? <laughs> oh God, I have no idea. <laughs> The computer is hot, right? So it should be running. <laughs> this is running on the GPU, right? Uh, part of the work we did here was to, to um, leverage the GPUs to do the work. Uh, this, this is starting to look like maybe something up here, but we'll, we'll just see. All right. It's the same thing it's been last time. Is it the same? Yeah, it doesn't look like it's got, you got anything. Click, <laughs> click what? Oh yeah, no, well, there, would be, there would be nothing if we forgot to do that. Um, All right, I think it's okay. Going. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's gonna, I think it's going. All right, so a demo fail is an option, by the way. Uh, we wanna keep that always in your, in your mind. We're doing this, it live. Uh, the Colossus machine, it looks really complicated. I wanna take away some of that complexity. 4,000. 4,000 key space, right? But basically, this is like six wheels that go around. They're kind of prime numbery wheels, right? So that there's a lot of complexity. There's a wheel that has nine gears, a wheel that has 12 and, and, and 13 and 15 and 17 and like this, right? So it's kind of prime numbery wheel gear thing. What they did in the Colossus was, first of all, they built an emulator for those wheels. So there's some tubes dedicated to just counting out prime numbers, right? They're prime counters. No big deal. The heavy lifting happens near this machine in the back with a wheel. Uh, that's where they feed the tape through. That's where the logical decisions are made, and that's what makes it a programmable computer because at the point at which the tape passes through the reader, they were able to set up logical tests on the data going through the reader. And those logical tests were programmable for, through, with punch, punch pads and various things. They had different uh, operators, XOR being uh, the one they used the most. Um, and those were then would output a value. And the rest of the machine is really just a decade counter. It counts numbers. And then it outputs the numbers in this typewriter here. So when you load up your crypt text, it starts off at the index of zero and it tests it against the key and then it advances it one index, right? And it text tests the crypt text against the key at the next position in, in the process. And so it's essentially brute forcing all the options um, that the key space can be in because when you, when you have a rotating system and you, and you spell out some starting position, it is one of the 4,000 starting positions that it could possibly be. They tried all of them. And essentially what they're counting out here is not the frequencies like we do of individual letters. They're actually just looking for doubled up letters. Doubled up letters were even more common than they would appear because they would use control characters like return and instead of typing return, they would type return, return because God forbid they would miss one. The machine would literally go off the end of the machine. I mean, you'd have to be pushing springs back into the machine if it didn't return uh, the carriage at the right time. Not literally, but I mean, it would just fail. It had no capability of recovering from a failed control character. So they were redundant in their control characters. Small operational detail, did I mention that? 
becomes a massive weakness, right? This entire machine is essentially created to count the duplicated event. A duplicated, an EE, for example, would come across as a KR. But if you match it up with a key just right, about 50% of the time it would come across as a GG. It's not the same character, but it is repeated. Because there were two parts to the Lawrence machine, they were essentially defeating the first one. The second, let's call it a cesarean cipher for the moment, it would still be cesarean. In other words, it would still be misaligned. Uh, but it was a thing, it was doubled. And so once they found the duplication of the characters in the first instance, they would go and then break the second, in, second instance. So cutting the algorithm in half is a very effective approach to, to breaking a complex algorithm. And that is exactly what they did with the Colossus um, and the Lawrence machine. Do you want to explain the slide? Sure. I have no idea <clears throat> how this got in there. So, uh, so the key here is that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Bletchley Park is creating the computer, and they're creating uh, our current codes. Uh, but because it's all secret, nobody knows. And the, the work gets reproduced. Um, uh, so <clears throat> later on, as the computer is reinvented, uh, and, uh, and IBM and Steve Wozniak, et cetera, et cetera, it'll later come out in 1977 when Bletchley Park is declassified that Bletchley Park has, in fact, been doing this all this time or had done this back in the day. Um, but you are looking at the inflection point of the creation of the computer, right? Um, the sort of the understanding that we can do these types of operations with bits and not characters, um, the, uh, the counting, um, all of the different components and basic parts um, of the computer um, exist at Bletchley Park in this effort at that time. It's all classified and it, it, it becomes a separate timeline because it's classified. There's a, a timeline that we're all familiar with of the creation of the computer and ENIAC at IBM and then the PC coming on. Um, and uh, uh, what we're saying is that there is in fact this other timeline, okay? And uh, How I Met Your Mother, right? A TV show uh, where Guy explains to his kids how he met their mother. And uh, uh, so what we're saying here is, uh, you know, it's like, hey, if you study this piece of history, if you're looking at this piece of history, this is how we met our mother, right? This is how we came to know the computer. This was the, the first step there. Um, it, it was a part of history that, again, we didn't know until much, much later, but it was a part of our history. So I like the second part of this, right? Alan Turing gets out of the war and he's like sworn to secrecy, he can't say that he just invented the motherfucking computer, right? He says, well, walking around these people and have abacuses in their hands and they're like, you know, writing stuff down on paper and just like a Yankee in King Arthur's court, like he's seen the future, he invented the computer, he's been using it for five years and he enters a world in which he can tell nobody that the computer has been invented. And he's like walking around like, oh dude, we could like a couple tubes and we could solve that problem, right? It's like, totally knows what's gonna happen in the future. A kind of a reversal there, but it does happen in England. After the war, the people who built the Colossus, of course, are immediately scooped up into massive projects, and it's like, <clears throat> where did this come from, right? Like this technology just dropped out of heaven. Um, and, and the computer industry immediately moves forward without a really great sense of its, of its origins at that point. Right, another piece that you, you need to remember is uh, the. NSA is involved in helping to make sure that DES, the first digital encryption standard, is secure. Um, and they review with IBM uh, what IBM has proposed for DES. They make some changes and they tweak it around. Um, but what IBM doesn't know is that NSA has in fact been involved in the effort to break both the um, Enigma and then the Lorenz machine. Um, so NSA knows these vulnerabilities, they understand these attacks and how they're gonna be used and how they can be used. And they in fact use their knowledge of these attacks, which is still classified at the time that DES is created and, and birthed, um, to help inform the creation of DES so that DES doesn't have these same vulnerabilities. Um, so it's again another part of sort of how I met your mother. It's, uh, it's the same thing sort of coming back. There is this second timeline, the second history of what's going on. So did we, uh, did we demo fail? Well, this is the point at which we really have to admit that <laughs> <laughs> there has been a major pileup on the GPU. It turns out that when we started uh, 
he was going to use his computer to do the presentation, and I was going to solve the problem on my GPU, and we decided, since his computer didn't have a connection to the uh, beautiful window here, that uh, we can do them both on the same computer. Well, it turns out that the GPU had another idea. So um, we will break this code, and uh, we will do it, but uh, it's not going to happen while we're running PowerPoint on the same GPU, apparently. All right. Note to self, right? Yeah, so last, last, when we did it in London, we did it with two, two computers. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I think we're getting pretty close to opening the floor for insults. Uh, right, so uh, Enigma crack, EnigmaCrack.com Enigma crack does include the source code, sample data, and uh, what's the other thing that's on there? Uh, well, there's an advertisement, actually, for cryptographic <laughs> right. service. If you need, like, your Enigma traffic deciphered, you know, Bob, see Bob. Right. right? Where are your guys? We really need more business. <laughs> I mean, we came to the con mostly to drum up, you know, cryptanalysis. If you've got an old Enigma machine That's in right. the basement, this is our vendor. It, this right? is our vendor pitch, right? So if you need your Enigma, if you need your Enigma stuff polished, deciphered, right, where are you your guys? Enigma polished, right? <laughs> right. We actually, by the way, we do, there is a guy in Charlotte that repairs Enigma machines. It's great, right? And he, he recasts the part, anything you need. So all your Enigma needs, enigmacrack.com. We will totally, totally set you up. Right. So the, uh, yeah, so enigmacrack.com has the source code. It has the sample data. It has a copy of the slides. Uh, everything else is there. So any Q&A? Anyone have any questions? And uh, we're gonna, I guess we're going to, let's fire this thing up. We're going to solve it. I really wish we could have shown the code because uh, we pulled some, it's SkyDog pertinent. Um, but, uh, speaking of SkyDog and crypto, can I throw a little quick pitch? Absolutely. The bed? Can I borrow your mic so I don't have to scream at people? You can even borrow my badge, actually, if you want to talk about the badge. Wow. No, he's talking about the other badge. He's talking about the other badge. All right, well. The cool badge, not the electronic one. Pay attention to what he's saying. It's okay, awesome. anybody try to figure out these badges yet? Anybody making any progress? Okay, want a little bit of input? input? Okay, so what do, what do we talk about here? We're talking about two different types of ciphers. The Lorenz was kind of a binary cipher, while the Enigma was an alphabetic cipher. So binary, you're doing zeros and ones and ones and zeros, but alphabetic, you have the letters A through Z. So everybody take a look at your badge for a minute. Not on the front with your name on it, but on the back with those funny little dog paws on there. What do you see? I see Lorenz cipher tape. You see a Lorenz cipher tape, okay, which has how many bits? Five bits. Hmm. How many toes on these dog paws, counting the pad in the middle? Five, right? Five, right. Now, how many letters in the alphabet? 26. 26. And if we throw a space in there, 27. How many different representations of a character can I do with five bits? 32. So can I fit the entire alphabet within a dog paw? Sure. Now, you notice that some of them are missing. It's not a typo. I thought at first it was a misprint. They said, ah, oh, no, I screwed it up. It's designed to get you to go meet somebody, so they'll fill in the blanks. So here's your question. And of course, you see up there, you got dog paws. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, G underscore Mark, I've got all the clues out there. But let's take a look at some of these guys out here, because here we see this dog paw. And we got a 50-50 chance. Either white is zero or white is one. Well, let's see, we see an awful lot of these things that are all blank, and so what do you think that probably means? White is? Space. Zero, it's a space. And so there's none that are all black paws, which would be consistent with the idea for encoding from a number space from zero to 31 that we're gonna run out at 27, and we're not gonna get to the last couple. Does that help you a little bit? They're all in the right order, too. So if you can count in binary, zero, one, one, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, oh, one, et cetera, et cetera, you might have a little bit of insight in terms of how to go ahead and crack that pretty basic because it is not a cipher. The back of this is simply an encoding. But it gets you started on round two, which is a rather simple cipher. And all the things that we have in rounds two, three, four, and five, you guys, I think, had mentioned at some point in time in your presentation what that cipher was. Uh -oh. So it's a kind of a nice convergence. So Thank any you, encryption services that you need rendered vis-a-vis -vis yeah. 1945 encryption, right? Talk to Bob. So I'm busy. Right. Do we have the next speaker? If we don't, I'm going to leave this thing going, right? right. Yeah. You okay? Yeah, I, I really want to break it. Fuck it. We'll do it twice. <laughs> right. <laughs> this rocks, by the way. Good stuff. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Sure. 
Yeah, so the question is, what makes you guys unique? Didn't they do this like 60 years ago already? Yes, but Alan Turing was tied up and couldn't be here. So, right, so like they didn't really have computers because Alan Turing didn't have a computer because as it turns out, Alan Turing didn't invent the computer yet. Um, when they did invent the Colossus computer, it only had the ability to count one bin. Whether the character was the same or not the same, that's it. Right? So we have 26 letters. We're doing frequency analysis by counting up 26 different buckets. The Enigma machine only had one bucket. That's wrong, by the way. It had five buckets in its Mark II version. Somebody's going to tell me why it had five buckets in its Mark II version, but it's not important. It only had one bin. So we could only tell whether the character was repeated or not repeated. That was sophisticated. That was used for the Lorentz. Getting close to frequency analysis. Not quite there. The, the bomb is not really a computing device in the, in the general sense. It's a logical test uh, whether or not it is possible for the simple rules of the Enigma machine to be respected and for this crypt text to be meaningful. Remember, a letter could not be mapped to itself. There was these simple breaks in the Enigma machine, and they used these logics. Uh, to test probable results. So they did essentially a, a kind of brute force rolling of these, uh, uh, of the wheels, and they were looking for a very specific logic text that would take the entire text and, and test it again against this logical test that was implemented in a, in a little simple relay circuit. They were starting with known plain text, weather station. They were looking for the word weather station in the, in the crypt text. So they would start with the word weather station and they would marry it to the crypt text in the first position. And then they would compare each of the letters manually. If the, if the W lined up with a W, it was a fail, right? If the E lined up with an E, it was a fail. So they would check to make sure there was no collisions. There was always a collision with 12 characters. It was very often a collision. Because uh, that's about half the, the, the um, alphabet, right? So then they would take and move it one position to the right and check it again. And they were looking for a place where this word, plain text, could fit in the crypt text. A known plain text attack. The answer really simply is that as a known plain text attack, what we did is a unknown plain text attack using modern technology uh, and very high-speed computers, which Alan Turing did not have because, as I mentioned, he hadn't invented it yet. So the, the cool thing when I was talking with you guys about it before that I, I didn't know was going to be in the talk was that a lot of the breaking, like hacking of crypto is because of implementation detail failures. Uh, operational security. Right, right. Like, why attack the, the, anal uh, the algorithm if you can just steal a key, right? Well, in this particular case, there's no operational use of the Enigma letter. So you can't go after the operator because right. there's nobody out there keying doing dumb stuff. And the only thing left to play with is the algorithm. But you're right, for modern crypto, that's charging right into the small wall. Right, there were... So right. there were a couple of sort of... We could have gone back to sort of original German, right? And there were a couple of times... The very beginning of the war, the Germans sort of double keyed the message setting. So they, they picked a, a random message setting, used that to encrypt the actual message setting, sent it twice, and then changed the message setting and then rolled out the message. And sort of that double keying, that if we'd keyed in on that, that would have just made this too easy, right? I mean, the problem would have ended up being trivial to break that. And, and you know, so as soon as we sort of realized, oh, well, we could probably break that real fast. I just threw it out. I said, you know, look, that's, it, it's not, that's not an intellectual challenge. I'm not even going to bother. The other thing that, um, that the Germans did is uh, they would key in punctuation. The, the Enigma machine only has 26 wheel positions, right, so the, the letters. So there's no space. There's no period, et cetera. So they would key in spaces as sort of XX, periods were YY, that type of thing. And if we had said, oh, well, the rules that we need in order to break it are that, you know, you have to, 
you know, key in the spaces is XX, you'd, you'd end up with these messages which just had this way off the chart, you know, kind of frequency. You know, there's a huge number of Xs and a huge number of double Xs, right? And, and again, from my perspective, that was, it was, it would have been so easy to break something like that that it was a trivially, trivial exercise and not intellectually challenging. So we went for, you know, hey, you're cute. This, this message has no spaces in it, right? There's no double X's, there's no Y's, et cetera. You'll read it, you'll be able to break the words out, but it's just, just the text. We focused exclusively on, um, on the frequency analysis. And I say there, there are two things that we have invented that, that did not pre-exist prior to us, and that is the Stecker isolation and the diagonal conflation, the fact that you don't need to guess the correct answer. Um, so what happens with the, di the diagonal conflation is this machine leaks entropy. So typically, if we're guessing a DES key, I give you, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 1, right? And we say, Does that, is that right or wrong? Same thing with password cracking. Is this right or wrong? And the system will usually return yes or no. It's binary, right? It's either right or it's wrong. The Enigma machine is, is playing a hot or colder game with us. And, and it's that hot or colder game that we're able to key in in order to break this thing in... in 20, uh, in 20 minutes or so. And um, uh, so we enter, okay, yeah, pick it up. We're almost done. All right, got it. Um, so what it does is, uh, is as we guess a key, you know, it says, okay, well, this has a certain amount of heat uh, attached to it. And we guess another key, and it's got a different amount of heat. You know, it's, it either got hotter or colder. It kind of tells us what direction to go away with. So, G Mark, I, I didn't know what to call that, right? I, I was like, so I asked, uh, I asked Dave uh, Schutz, I was like, David, so the, the system leaks entropy. I'm playing hot or colder with it. Uh, it's a crypto system. What is that called? He's like, I have no idea. And I was like, I don't know either. It's, it's like there's no name for that because no system does that, right? It's completely insane. Uh, so again, this thing kind of tells you how close you're getting to the right answer. Yeah, well, any polyalphabetic cipher is going to have that same characteristic. Correct. And I say, but I don't, I don't know a name for that. So anyway, we... Yeah, we just called it the hotter, colder game. That was uh, close enough. So anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna unplug it, let uh, our next speakers uh, talk, but maybe we'll hang out on the couch and uh, let this thing run, and, uh, and maybe we'll interrupt them or something like that if we get it. You hear this loud, right? <laughs> Huzzah! We got it. <laughs> all right. So thank you all very much. Oh, sorry. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.